Am I on? Yeah. <sighs> it's kind of like life. We have to turn our mics on, don't we? Yes. Let's turn our consciousness on. Okay, that's the talk. I'm done. <laughs> Let's go watch the 49ers. Okay, so I want to clear up something, as long as we're on that subject. There was a team that played on Thursday night. Yeah, they played really well. Yeah, I love that team. <laughs> There's a team that's playing, I believe, today. Yeah. yeah, I like that team too. It's only when they're playing each other <laughs> that we'll have a conflict. <laughs> just, I just want you to know that. You know, somebody invited me to, you know, I might be wearing the 49ers. I don't think I'm going to fit into her 49ers outfit. Though. That was cute. <laughs> uh, how many people saw the little girl up there wearing the... You had to be up front, but she was wearing a little San Francisco 49ers outfit. And so, uh, yeah, it's a little small for me, but uh, I like the 49ers. I've always liked the 49ers. I used to live in San Francisco. I've actually sat on the 50-yard line on some really nice seats for the 49ers games. So, um, so, so I, just, I just don't want to you know, have a misimpression of me. <laughs> and for the rest of you who don't give a darn about football and you're sitting there going, oh, come on, get to the talk. We'll get to the talk. <laughs> so I'm doing a completely different talk than I did at the first service. So if you want to get the first service talk, you'll have to watch that on the video or, or get a CD of it. So because I had a whole different idea. Yesterday I was sitting here writing my talk, and I finished the talk, and then another talk downloaded. And so Charlie and Sue came by here at about 9, 9.15 last night, and they said, your car was still in the parking lot. It's like, yeah. Spirit had another idea of, of something else it wanted to say. And I was trying to figure out how to put the two talks together, and I finally realized it was not going to work together, just do two talks. So, the question, is it really true, prompts the question of what is true? What is, capital T, true? And as I mentioned last night on Facebook, I know Kim saw it, we're going to step into quantum, the quantum physics soup. And she invited me to bring a string theory salad along with that, I believe. String theory pasta, there we go. I'm going to play with a book that I actually just left sitting over there, didn't I? Called Quantum Thinking, the book that's... That one right there, yeah. Or, no, I'm sorry, it's on the air pile. It's the bottom of the air pile. The other one is a quantum thinking book, too. It's called Science of Mind. <laughs> Which really is a quantum thinking book. Do you quantum think? Luke, is this a good book? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I know because he's read it. These are available in the bookstore. There's two of them if you count the one that I've kind of handled a little bit here. We won't charge you extra for the fact that I handled it if you want to buy that one. <laughs> Blessed by the guru and all that stuff. So reality is context dependent. How's that for a couple of words? Context dependent. And context is the frame that we bring or the lens that we, we view the world with. Our reality is based on what we bring to look at reality with. What is capital T true is what we bring as true. Take a breath. We have this, we grew up with most of us with this idea that there is a fixed capital R reality out there somewhere, and if we could all just clearly perceive it and agree on it, that's what it is. Uh-uh. As Fred Allen Wolf, the great quantum physicist, has said, there is no out there, out there. There is no out there, out there. There is no official reality out there. We work in a quantum field of infinite possibility, which means everything is possible, and it arises and becomes our reality based on the way that we frame it and, and what we choose to look at. Take a breath. How are you doing with that idea? Excellent. Okay. So we're going to play. So a lot of people get disturbed by it. No, there is a reality back there. It says so in the Bible. We'll talk about that in a minute. So where I aim my lens or the, the frame that I hold up is what I perceive as reality. And it becomes my reality. It becomes where I put my consciousness. As we have this, this wonderful reading from Ernest Holmes today, the law follows the word. And the word follows the desire, and the desire follows my attention. 
So as I put my attention, as I hold that frame up, that's what I'm looking at, and that's what becomes my reality. Out of all the infinite possibilities of reality, we get to create our own that way. And our realities are based on our conditioning. Isn't that wonderful and exciting? Or not? The wonderful and exciting part is we can change our conditioning. Most of us grew up knowing a bunch of stuff. We knew that two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time, right? We knew that if an object travels from one place to another, it goes through a certain path, that you can follow that path and watch it uh, go through that, that, that space. So let me speak from this microphone here. We know that the world is a mechanical operation and it's kind of winding down to an end. How many preachers do we know that have made their entire living off of the end times? Okay. We know what an atom looks like. You know, it has a, a, a center, a nucleus, and with protons and neutrons in it, and then it has electrons and a nice little neat orbit around it, and they always stay in the same place and do the same thing all the time. We know that material things and spiritual things are separate from each other. We basically know that everything is separate from each other and we live in an either-or reality. That's what a lot of us grew up learning though, isn't it? We were certain that that's the way it was. So, Diane Collins, who's the author of this book, talks about we live in a universe of systems and our everyday world is comprised of systems, yet it doesn't occur to us, to most of us, that we think in one system or another. So when you drive to the grocery store or the market, every system along the way is shaping your actions. The door of the house or the apartment you are walking through to get outside, and, and aside from that, when you go to buy, a, a, say, a large piece of furniture, what's one of the first questions you ask yourself? Will it fit in the door? And so our doors determine our furniture purchase, right? For some of us. So the door of the house, the, uh, of the house, the apartment you are walking out to get outside, the road system with its speed limits and red and green stop and go lights, the sequence of the aisles in the supermarket, all of these are systems. Even the food options we have available to us are a result of a complex of systems from growing methods to government regulations to marketing and economic systems. And a system is like a vortex. Once you're in it, it takes you with it. If you try to drive outside the road system, you only get so far until you're forced back inside the system. This is why when you try to change something, the change often doesn't work or it doesn't last. Even a novel idea or the most brilliant plan is likely to get swept into the powerful force of the existing system. So most of us are working in systems of thought. I see you shaking your head. And I thought of you when I was writing that, reading this. Because I remember just a week or two ago, you came up to me and said, and, 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 for all the, you know, and we all do this, that I was thinking that there was something going on that was one way, and you thought I was a kook, and I finally realized I am a kook because it wasn't really that that was happening at all. It was something completely over here. How many of us have had that experience? We think we know what's going on. We think it's this way, and suddenly we find out it's something completely different over here. So we all get caught up in systems. <laughs> we, I get caught up in the system of needing to be right. The second quote of this comes from Emily Cady in her book, Lessons of Truth. She was a unity writer of about 100 years ago. She says, every man believes himself to be in bondage to the flesh and to the things of the flesh, all suffering as a result of this belief. So we have a belief that says 
This body is real and causes us suffering. This stuff is real and causes us suffering. And we have no control over it. We talk about how our bodies are doing this. My body is feeling this way. My body is telling me this. Your body is not telling you anything. Your consciousness is telling you something through your body. Ernest Holmes reminds us that the body is an effect, not a cause. Consciousness is cause. Consciousness is cause. And it may have to speak through the body for us to actually hear it. It may say, you really need some rest. And the body finally goes, blunk. And we say, my body's telling me. But no, your consciousness is telling you. Your highest wisdom self is telling you. It's just using the body as the vehicle to tell you that. Another way of system thinking is we talk about, this morning we had something called a sunrise, right? And this evening we'll have a sunset. Does the sun really move relative to the earth? No. It doesn't rise and it doesn't set. We rotate. But we don't think in that way. We think of the earth as flat. We perceive the earth as still flat, even though it's a sphere. We talk about the four corners of the earth. We talk about, I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Where's the ends of the earth? Where's the four corners of a sphere? So we have a system of thinking that we're so used to and we're so trapped in and we never think about what we think about. We never think about the system itself. And so we go in and we try. And this is why it sometimes is so tough in our, in our teaching, in our way of working. We're trying to change our thinking, but our system of thinking keeps us imprisoned in where we are. Our worldview doesn't just shape what we think. It also allows and speaks to us of what we're even able to think. 150 years ago, most people were not able to think of getting from here to, let's say, Seattle in two hours. Today, you would sit here and go, no problem. I can go down, grab an airplane, and be up there in two hours. Up until just over 100 years ago, 115, 120 years ago, if you wanted to get from some place to the other, you walked or got involved with an animal that was either going to you know, carry you or pull a cart or something that you were involved with. For thousands and thousands and thousands of years, that's what humankind did. And it wasn't until just over 100 years ago that somebody invented a horseless carriage and somebody started inventing airplanes and we started to have a quantum leap. And that term, by the way, wasn't used before about 1927, when quantum theory first started to really become a little bit more known in the public consciousness. And so if you go back to somebody from, say, 1905 and say, I just made a quantum leap in consciousness, they'd sit there and go, what are you talking about? We couldn't think of instant communication up until, relatively speaking, recently. Radio waves, television. I remember, I, I'm that old, I remember the first television in my neighborhood. And we'd all go over to the person's house, and I hated that because the kid was a bully. But we'd all go over to the neighbor's house and watch their sepia-toned television. It wasn't even black and white, it was kind of brown and white. We never thought of something called an internet. We had no consciousness of that. Some of you who are younger, it's like you're sitting there going, huh, what, it wasn't an internet? Yes, believe it or not, at some point in time prior to your birth, there was no internet. <laughs> cell phones. You know, I remember being a tester uh, with the Seattle to Portland bike ride for some of the early cell phones and, and, and how they were, you know, in, in reception. We, we, a bunch of us had those early brick phones. How many people remember the brick cell phones, okay? <laughs> I was trying to find one. I actually have a couple still sitting at home from those days. But, but they were you know, humongous things. We used to have a phone, a calendar. It was a separate device. Something to listen to music on. That was a separate device. We used to have our paper maps. That was a separate device. We used to have a camera as a separate device. And then we went home to our desktops if we wanted to get on the internet. Today, we can all do that from here. 
Now, I want to show you what, or talk to you about how that works and, and the consciousness and the system of thinking. A couple of weeks ago, we were playing a game of uh, categories at, at uh, one of the Nourish Our Community events, which is where you play uh, trying to figure out the definition of a really weird sounding word. And somebody said, I wonder what the origin of that word was. You know, wh what's the origin of that word? I happen to have had the privilege in my life of working a long time with people who are about 20 to 25 years younger than me, and so I tend to think a little younger than most people at my age do. They all sat around and said, I wonder what that means, and I hauled out my smartphone and started looking it up in the dictionary. They go, oh yeah, we could do that. Okay? But we don't think of it as possible. We don't think of the possibility. What in your life is calling for you to think of a possibility that you haven't even given yourself permission or the ability to think of because of your current system of thinking? What are you being called to that's greater than that? So we believe that we think freely. We like to think of it, especially religious, we're religious scientists, we're free thinkers, right? And we're Americans, we're free thinkers. No, we're not. We think within the system of thought that we're operating in. Our system of thought is, is you know, so, I mean, as a religious scientist, we sit there and we see the earth and we see the universe as a system of law and love, a response to our consciousness if we're paying attention. And we have a bunch of stuff that we perceive the world as. Have you noticed that not everybody has that system of thought? Okay? For some people, it's, if it's not in the Bible, it's not true, or if it's not in the Quran, it's not true. Okay? That's one of the things I'm glad that, that Diana is teaching the, the Bible class is because we're going to start to break through some of that perception, some of that myth, and we're going to start to look at it in different ways, in different consciousness, from a different system of thought. And a lot of us are scared of the Bible because in our past we've had it used to be shoved down our throats or beaten over the head with or used to justify some really weird things. Okay? And there's a whole other way, in like fact, multiple ways of looking at the Bible beyond that. And so she's got a class coming up that's talking about that. That's my shameless plug for Diana's class right there. Our system of thinking creates the background in which we think. And it creates automatic thinking for us. We just automatically react to something. We automatically do something. Stephen Hawking, who, by the way, is a person who has to think outside of the normal because somebody who's in his physical condition shouldn't be, you know, doing much other than kind of, you know, hiding out, right? Yeah, but he's one of the most brilliant people on earth. He got outside that thing. He says, quantum theory is a completely different picture of reality, so it should concern us all but it is hardly known outside the physics and chemistry field and not even properly understood by many in those fields. So we're looking at a new picture of reality and we as religious scientists should be on the cutting edge because we're always sitting there going, what is true? What is reality? What is deeper? How can I see spirit more powerfully? How can I see the infinite more clearly? And so that is a system of thinking that is, that is a new picture of reality. So how can we play with this? How do we break free of the system of thought? That's the question, isn't it? How do we break free the system of thought? One of the suggestions is we become shamans. We become shamans. Now, it doesn't mean go take a shamanic training somewhere, but we start to think as a shaman. A shaman works in multiple realities at once. A shaman perceives not only the world of physical reality, but the world of spirit reality, the world of energy reality. We start to look at it from a different perspective than just you know, the physical, what we're looking at stuff. We work in, we, the shaman works in many dimensions and lives in a deep wisdom. Um, Alberto Villaldo, I'm not sure who he is, but, but I found this wonderful quote. Everyone else is waiting for eternity. And the shamans are saying, how about tonight? <laughs> Everyone else is waiting for heaven. And we're saying, how about now? How about tonight? In order to shift from our system of thinking, we have to live from a new reality. Those of you who were in the Prosperity Plus class, remember Mary Manamorosi saying, you can't get there 
where you want to go from here. You get there by being there. Just as an electron, a quantum particle, will jump its, its orbit without leaving any path, it'll just simply show up somewhere else in the orbit. No path, no logical way to do it, it just is there. We can do that. Take a breath. We, you, me, can do that. We have that ability. If it can be done on the micro level, it can be done on the macro level. If it operates somewhere in the universe, it operates everywhere in the universe. I should be seeing exciting faces, excited faces out here right now. I see some. I see a big smile back there. You're getting it. We can shift our consciousness. We can shift our lives. We can be where we want to be right now. We leap and then we look. <laughs> now that goes against everything that most of us were taught, doesn't it? Be cautious. Play it safe. Look before you leap. Check it all out. Einstein said there comes a point where the mind takes a higher plane of knowledge but can never prove how it got there. And that is the basis of all invention. The mind takes a higher plane of knowledge. In the 70s, I, uh, or 80s, I should say, I, I studied with a gentleman named Robert Fritz who uh, had a program called DMA, wrote a book called The Path of Least Resistance. And he was a musician. He approached personal growth seminars from a different way than most personal growth seminars were doing it. And one of the things that he had done was he had interviewed uh, the uh, software engineers at Lotus Engineering, Lotus uh, Software back in Boston. And by, many of you may not ever remember Lotus anymore, but they were at one point in time the leading cutting edge software company in, in the country. They had a product called Lotus 123, which was the best spreadsheet out there. And they had other programs that were just you know, outstandingly really, really good back in the 80s. Eventually they got bought off by um, a company from Seattle, <clears throat> <laughs> who when they couldn't figure out how to do it, bought somebody else who was doing it. But he interviewed Lotus engineers and he says, how are you making these, these great leaps and these great jumps? He, sa he said, once they kind of got that they could trust him, they kinda, he said they kind of looked kind of sheepish and they said, well, we actually just kind of do it and then we figure out how we got there afterwards and document it. We just make it up. We just make it up. Guess what? Your life, you've made it up. You can make up a different life. I love it when Michael talked about that in a previous life he was a lesbian, I mean a thespian. <laughs> Where is he? Oh, he's there, yeah. <laughs> And, and oftentimes we refer to that, don't we? We have a previous life. In a previous life, I did this. In a previous life, I did that. Do you know what? A hundred years ago, nobody was saying that. And so we have this opportunity to literally create multiple lifetimes within our own life. We have the opportunity and the ability to jump and jump and jump and reinvent ourselves and do it again and again and again. Many of us already have. You're free to do that. Somebody in the workshop, we were at uh, Andrew Oster's workshop yesterday, was saying, it's like, you know, if I, I, I feel like I need permission to do something. It's like, you have permission. If you need an authority figure to, you know, you know, I give you permission. I've got another minister right here, Reverend Sue. She'll give you permission to be all that you want to be. I'm speaking for you, but is that, are you good with that? Okay, good. She says, yes, you can be all you want to be. You get to make it up. Thoreau said, if you've built castles in the air, that's the place for them. Now put foundations underneath them. Go live in them and build the foundations underneath them. So, how does this look in practical reality? Want to take a breath and go somewhere perhaps slightly awkward with me? Let's say just a hypothetical case that some people come and visit our property, take some of our wood, break up some of our picnic tables, and use it to build a fire in the back lawn. Just a theoretical. 
We have a couple ways we can approach that. One old system of thinking is to view the world as dangerous, to see ourselves as separate from those people, and to feel that we need to do something to protect ourselves, to capture them, and to punish them. That's an old system of thinking. But it's a very powerful system. It exists a lot in our culture, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, it does. That's why I have jails full of all sorts of people. We also have the opportunity to do a new way of thinking. We have the opportunity to remember what it is that we teach, that the universe is in a conspiracy for our good and that we are all one. There is no separation. There's a, there's a practice in Buddhism where you spend your day walking around picturing everyone you meet as the Buddha, an enlightened master here to teach you a spiritual lesson. What if we were visited by Buddhas recently? Take a breath. What if we and they are one? What if we're being invited to learn something new, to create a new meaning out of this? What if we're invited to look and say, where does this live within my consciousness? Reverend Sue and I were talking about that in between the services. And I talked in the first service that I just had an experience a couple weeks ago where I was feeling a little knocked off my center. And it was regarding this, this particular center. And I, I went into my little ditty, my old system of thinking, you know, poor me. I, I have one of those. It's okay if you do too. And I realized afterwards that, that uh, I also am aware of a lot of, of mythopoesis, mythopoetics and, and mythology and how it relates to, to us and the archetypes that we live in. And one of the archetypes is the king archetype. And as the spiritual leader of, of this community, when I'm in that role, I fit into that king and shaman archetype. Okay? And I realized that when the king is off the throne, when the king ab or queen abdicates their power, chaos happens in the kingdom or the queendom. When we are out of our power, our lives get chaotic. And I realized that for me it was a call to, to get over my self-pity and get back into my power and stand up and be the minister that I'm here to be. Okay? What that means is an invitation for you to be the enlightened, beautiful beings that you are here to be. This is an invitation for us to look and say, are we going to live by old consciousness, which starts to say, how many security cameras can we get? How many thousands of dollars can we get? Trenching system to get the cables to run out there for the cameras. All the stuff, you know, to dig it up. I mean, we'll do more damage to the place by, you know, putting the cameras up there than, we, than has been done already. Or do we stand in a consciousness and apply our teaching and say that we are going to hold this place in prayer, in high consciousness, so that all that happens here is sacred and respectful. And we stand in that consciousness and we believe that, that we are the sentinels in consciousness that keeps this place safe and only people who are respectful show up here and only people who treat this place respectfully are the people who are here. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to actually be religious scientists? Are we willing to actually practice what we teach? Frustrating sometimes. Sometimes we so want to go to that other place. Somebody does us dirty, and we want to do them dirty back. Except that person who's doing them, us dirty is, guess who? Us. We're one. Yogananda said there is no space between, mind and, between minds and souls, though their physical being vehicles may be far apart. There is no space between you, between me, between whoever they were or are. There is no space between us, even if our physical vehicles are far apart. We are one. So we begin to change the broadcast of what we as a, as a community are beginning to send out. You know, I have to laugh because 
We've, we've had a couple of articles about the labyrinth. We had one just in the current Enjoy magazine that calls out the labyrinth. And when I first got here, I was shown a, a newspaper article that was fairly recent about our beautiful labyrinth, I think back from when it was first built. And we, and we like to invite people on the grounds to, to experience the labyrinth and experience the beauty of the grounds. And then I've noticed a couple of times that when people show up here, everybody gets suspicious. Who is that person? What are they doing here? What do they want? <laughs> It's like, okay, do we want them here or do we not want them here? One, one, one evening, a, a carload of, of, two carloads of young men showed up in the, in the lot right over here and got out and, and headed back for the labyrinth. And um, one of the staff members was like, David, go check them out. Who are they? What are they doing back there? You know, and it was kind of this, you know, from fear suspicion basis. And, and so I went back there, and here they were in a circle around the labyrinth with the volleyball playing past the volleyball back and forth, just working on their volleyball skills, their passing skills around the labyrinth. What came to me as I was thinking about that earlier today was sometimes we as guys don't want to admit our spiritual lives, not, not so much the men here, but you know, men outside of here don't really want to admit our spiritual selves. So we get busy doing something else while we do the spiritual self. So it's like the soul, their souls are taking a walk through the labyrinth while their bodies and their minds are busy playing volleyball because their souls are called. They could do that in any parking lot anywhere. They could do that on any flat surface anywhere, but they chose the labyrinth. Thank God. And so something within them deeply is calling them to that labyrinth to say, I want to go through that experience. So we start to change our broadcast. We start to change what we put out into the universe. We change our world by intention. So we hold our intention for the highest and best. What is my intention in any given moment? We start paying attention to our intention. What is my intention now? What is my intention now? Fred Allen Wolf again says, our minds are not just along for the ride in an impersonal universe. Instead, we define the fabric of reality at a fundamental level with the choices we make, the things we choose to see or not see, and most importantly, our intentions in each moment. That's a quantum physicist talking. That's not a religious leader, not a spiritual leader. That's a quantum physicist. Michael Beckwith, who talks about the four kingdoms of consciousness, says all four are ruled by intention, always ruled by intention. No matter how high we get in the kingdoms, always ruled by intention. So I do I look at each moment as an opportunity to know myself as spirit more fully. If something happens that I don't like, do I take that as an opportunity to know myself as spirit more fully? Do I look for the good, which is our talk next week? Am I willing to see that? And sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's really, really hard, isn't it? And it's okay to feel the feelings when it's really hard. You don't want to do the spiritual bypass and just say, oh, I'm just going to ignore the fact that I feel hurt and angry and, and scared by that. No, you feel that. It's true. That's part of your reality. And it's okay to feel that. We're here to play in that game also. But eventually we find a place where we can move through that game and move through that feeling and say, and at the same time, what's the higher vision that's being called through here? Yes, I feel hurt. What's the higher vision that's being called? Yes, I feel angry. I want to go punch somebody. What's the higher vision that's being called? Yes, I feel scared. We were talking about both, both uh, Charlie and Sue and, and myself were here at separate times on the campus last night walking through there. And we were both kind of walking through there a little scared. What happens if one of these big guys on drugs that has no you know, reasoning power is, is out there? And, and what happens? And so, you know, as, as Mary Manna Morrissey says, you do it afraid. You do it afraid. But we do it. We go for where we want to go. So do we intend to practice this? Or do we want to retreat into fear? You know, when we talk about these things, I love it. We're a religious science church. We're not, we're not someplace that you've never heard this before. This is not new to most of you as an idea. It's just a reminder. Just shift your system of thinking. And then we finally we ask our question, where does this live within me? Because ultimately that's the question we always have to ask. Whatever looks to be happening out there is living within me. Where does this live within me? And how do I heal that? Take a breath. How do I heal that? 
So this week, I invite you to do three things. First, create an intention to know and view the world as good. Create an intention. And if you already have that intention, deepen that intention to view and to know the world as good. Is it, it's in a conspiracy for your good. I refuse to participate in the fear system. I refuse to participate in the fear system. Secondly, pay attention to my assumptions and beliefs. This is my subtle system of thinking. Pay attention. See if you can identify your own system. Sometimes it's really hard within the system, but sometimes you can and pay attention to it. And finally, set a daily intention to love, to, to live as an agent of spiritual awakening. How would you like to be a 007 of spiritual awakening? <laughs> Hi, I'm not here from M6 or whatever it is, fear-based. And I'm here from spirit as an agent of spiritual awakening. I'm here to love. I'm here to be a light. I'm here to be a beacon. I'm here to look into the darkest corners and say, I choose to be a light in that corner anyways. Not run away from it, but choose to be a light in the darkest corners of my own consciousness and the darkest corners of our collective consciousness. I choose to be a shaman. I want to close with a poem from Hafiz, great Sufi mystic. What is this precious love and laughter budding in our hearts? It is the glorious sound of a soul waking up. And that is what you and I are, our souls waking up. I invite you this week to continue to your waking up journey. And Judy's going to play while, we, while I pray and do a prayer around that. So remember that there is only one infinite presence. Pure good, pure love, pure wholeness. The absolute sweetness of spirit. We live in the heart of God, and that heart is infinite, which is pretty darn big. That spirit, that infinite one, that beautiful love, that good is all that there is. There is nothing outside of that. It is a good that is beyond our ideas of good and bad, right or wrong. As that other great Sufi poet Rumi says, out beyond the ideas of right thinking and wrong thinking, there is a field, I'll meet you there. And so we meet in that field. We move our consciousness as we deeper into that field. We take that quantum leap into the new reality that we choose to manifest on earth. We stop praying for peace and we are peace. We stop waiting for heaven and somebody else to do it, and we become it now. We stop looking for a savior, recognizing that we are the ones we've been looking for, that we are our own savior. Now, there is that wisdom within us that knows exactly how to do this, exactly how to manifest it. We don't have to, from the intellectual side, figure it out. We can't figure it out. But we open to that infinite presence. We open to that love. We open to that wisdom. We open to that which is screaming and calling and crying to us. Take the leap. Don't wait until you figure it out. Do it now. Heaven is present here and now. And we say yes to that heaven. We recognize that we already live within it and all we need to do is change our framing and we get to see it. And so for each person who is waking up, for each person who is saying yes to this, I'm so grateful. For the process of waking up itself and then for the spirit within it all, I am ever so grateful. It's a beautiful, lovely process. Sometimes it is messy. Sometimes it is sublime. And it is all spirit. We simply say yes. We let it be. And together it is, we say, and so it is.